feasted in a gompa. He's talking about his travels again. What happened on the way? Okay, we're trying to get to where he finds this and reads these scrolls. Okay, uh, So this Buddhist sect believes in the Creator. He's still going on about his visits and all this information, and then he's getting into the Buddha, talking about the Buddha, and the Buddha three thousand years before and what he did, etc. Guy eventually he, he meets he eventually he brings him two volumes in cardboard covers, isolated verses which frequently bear no connection between each other. And at Murray he meets a Frenchman, kind Frenchman, Count Andre de Saint Fal, who has taken a pleasure trip through Hindustan. He the author the says he long cherished the project of publishing the memoirs on the life of Jesus Christ which he found at Hemis and of which he had already spoken but affairs of all sorts completely absorbed his time until that day and so forth he finally says, it's only after many sleepless nights spent in the classification of all his notes after grouping the verses in conformity with the course of the narrative and and imprinting the character of unity to the entire work that he finally consented to give publication to the curious manuscripts that followed. Okay, the life of Saint Isa, the best of the sons of men. One, one, the earth has trembled and the heavens have wept because of the great crime just committed in the land of Israel. Two, for they have put to torture and executed the great just Isa in whom dwelt the spirit of the world. 3. Which was incarnated in a simple mortal, that mean might be benefited and evil thoughts exterminated thereby. 4. And that it might bring back to life, to a life of peace, of love and happiness, man degraded by sin, and recall to him the only and indivisible creator, whose mercy is boundless and infinite. 5. This is what is related on this subject by the merchants who have come from Israel. 2. One, the people of Israel who inhabited a most fertile land, yielding two crops a year, and who possess immense flocks, excited the wrath of the God through their sins. Two, and he inflicted upon them a terrible punishment by taking away their land, their flocks, and all they possessed, and Israel was reduced to slavery by the rich and powerful pharaohs or kings who then reigned in Egypt. The latter treated the Israelites more cruelly than animals, loading them with chains and putting them to the roughest labor. They covered their bodies with bruises and wounds and denied them food and shelter. 4. That they might be kept in a state of continual terror and robbed of all semblance of humanity. 5. And in their diet distressed the children of Israel, remembering their heavenly protector, addressed their prayers to him and implored his assistance and mercy. 6. An illustrious pharaoh or king of Egypt then reigned in Egypt, who had become celebrated for his numerous victories, the great riches he had amassed, and the vast palaces which his slaves had erected with their own hands. This pharaoh had two sons, the younger of whom was called Mossa. Okay, so they try to say here that the king of Egypt had a son. Maybe it was Moses that was brought into that uh, Egyptian palace, etc. Right? Maybe it's not necessary that his uh, wife or his daughter had given birth to Moses, this Mossa, right? And the learned Israelites taught him diverse sciences. And Mossa was beloved throughout the land of Egypt for his goodness and the companion, compassion he displayed for them that suffered. 
9. Seeing that notwithstanding the intolerable sufferings they endured, the Israelites refused to abandon the God to worship those created by the hands of man and which were the gods of the Egyptians. 10. Mosa believed in their indivisible God who did not allow their flagging strength to falter. 11. And the Israelite preceptors encouraged Moses at door and had recourse to him, begging him to intercede with the king or Pharaoh, his father, in favour of his co-religionists. Uh, 12. Prince Mosa pleaded with his father to soften the lot of these unhappy people, but Pharaoh or the king became angry with him and only imposed more hardship upon his slaves. 13. It came to pass not long after that a great calamity fell upon Egypt. The plague decimated the young and the old, the strong and the sick, and Pharaoh or the king believed he had incurred the wrath of his own gods against him. 14. But the prince, Mosa, declared to his father that it was the god of his slaves who were interfering in favour of his unhappy people and punishing the Egyptians. The king commanded Moses, his son, to gather all the slaves of the Jewish race to lead them away to a great distance from the capital and found another city where he should remain with them. 16. Mosa announced to the Hebrew slaves that he had delivered them in the name of their God, the God of Israel, and he went with them out of the city and of the land of Egypt. 17. He therefore led them into the land they had lost through their many sins. He gave them laws and enjoined them to always pray to the invisible creator whose goodness is infinite. 18. At the death of the prince, Mosa, the Israelites rigorously observed his laws and God recompensed them for the wrongs they had suffered in Egypt. 19. Their kingdom became the most powerful in all the world. Their kings gained renown for their treasures and a long period of peace prevailed among the children of Israel. 3. 1. The fame of the riches of Israel spread over all the world and the neighbouring nations envied them. They grew jealous of them, right? 2. But the victorious arms of the Hebrews were directed by the Most High himself and the pagans did not attack them. 3. Unhappily, as man does not always obey even his own will, the fidelity of the Israelites to the God was not of long duration. 4. They began by forgetting all the favours he had shown, showered upon them, invoked his name on rare occasions only, and begged protection of magicians and wizards. 5. The kings and rulers substituted their own laws for those that Mosa had prepared. The temple of God and the practice of religion were abandoned. The nation gave itself up to pleasures and lost its original purity. 6. Many centuries had elapsed since the departure from Egypt when God again resolved to punish them. 7. Strangers began to invade the land of Israel, devastating the fields, destroying the villages and taking the inhabitants into captivity. 8. A throng of pagans came from over the sea, from the country of Rome or less. They subjected the Hebrews and the commander of the army governed them by authority of Caesar. 9. The temples were destroyed, the people were forced to abandon the worship of the invisible God and to sacrifice victims to pagan idols. 10. Warriors were made of the nobles, the women were ravished from their husbands, the lower classes reduced to slavery, were sent by thousands beyond the sea, and so forth. In the stars distress, the people remembered their powerful God, they implored his mercy and besought him to forgive them. Our Father in his inexhaustible goodness heeded their prayers. Uh, and so forth. Soon after a wonderful child was born in the land of Israel, God himself through the mouth of this child spoke of the nothingness of the body and of the grandeur of the soul. The parents of this newborn child were poor people belonging by birth to a family of exalted piety which disregarded its former worldly greatness to magnify the name of the Creator and thank him for the misfortunes with which he was pleased to try them. 7. To reward them for their perseverance in the path of truth, God blessed the firstborn of his, this family. He chose him as the elect and sent him forth to raise those that had fallen into evil and to heal them that suffered. 8. The divine child to whom was given the name of Esau commenced even in his most tender years to speak of the one and indivisible God, exhorting the people that had strayed from the path of righteousness to repent and purify themselves of the sins they had committed. 9. People came from all parts to listen and marvel at words of wisdom that fell from his infant lips. All the Israelites united in proclaiming that the eternal spirit dwelt within this child. 10. When Issa had attained the age of 13, when an Israelite should take a wife, uh, the house in which his parents dwelt and earned their livelihood and modest labour became a meeting place for the rich and noble, etc., etc. It was then that Issa clandestinely left his father's house, went out to Jerusalem, and in company with some merchants, travelled towards Sindh. 
the 13. That he might perfect himself in the divine word and study the laws of the great Buddhas. 5. 1. In this course of his 14th year, in the course of his 14th year, young Isa, blessed by God, journeyed to beyond the sender and settled among the areas, or areas, probably areas, in the beloved country of God. 2. The fame of his name spread along the northern Sindh. When he passed Sindh, when he pin, passed through the country of the five rivers of and the Rajipotan, the worshippers of the god Dijaina begged him to remain in their midst. Three, but he left for the he left the misguided admirers of Dijaina and visited Juggernaut in the province of Osis, where the remains of Vyasa Krishna rest and where he received a Jewish welcome from the white priest of Brahma. 4. They taught him to read and understand the Vedas, to heal by prayer, to teach and explain the Holy Scripture, to cast out evil spirits from the body of man, and give him back human semblance. 5. He spent six years in Juggernaut, Rajigriha, Rajigriha, Benarius, and the other holy cities. All loved him, for Isa lived in peace with the Vaisyas and the Sodras, to whom he taught the Holy Scripture. But 6. But the Brahmans and the Kshatriyas declared that the great Para Brahma forbade them to approach those whom he had created from his entrails and from his feet. 7. That the Vaisyas were authorized to listen only to the readings of the Vedas and it never saved on feast days. Uh, etc. etc. Uh, giving all these dictates and he it's just said, nah, he's not listening to them. And going to the Sudras preach against Brahmins and the Kshatriyas. And he denounced them. He denied the divine origins of the Vedas and the Puranas, declaring that to his followers that one law had been given to men to guide them in their actions. 13. Fear thy God, bow down the knee before him only, and to him only must thy offerings be made. Isa denied the Timurti and the incarnation of Para Brahma and Vishnu, Siva, and other gods, saying, 15. The eternal judge, the eternal spirit, composes one and indivisible soul of the universe, which alone creates, contains, and animates the whole. 16. He alone has willed and created, he alone has existed from eternity, it will exist without end. He has no equal, neither in heaven nor on earth, etc., etc. 17. He is the Lord of all. Probably up into the point where they got him, planning to kill him, and they threw him out on the road and went back to Jerusalem. Okay, left, left Nepal and the Himalaya mountains, descended into the valley of Raji Bhutan, and went westward, preaching to the diverse people of the supreme perfection of man, and so forth. Words of Isa spread among the pagans and the countries through which he travelled and the inhabitants abandoned their idols. Okay, seeing which the priest demanded from him who glorified the name of the true God, proofs of the accusations he brought against him and demonstrations of the worthlessness of idols in the presence of the people. And Issa replied to them, If your idols and animals are mighty and really possess a supernatural power, let them annihilate me on the spot. For perform a miracle, retorted the priests, and let thy God confound their own, if they are loathsome to him. 5. But Isa said, Isa said, The miracle of God began when the universe was created. They occur every, each day, each instant. Whosoever does not see them is deprived of one of the most beautiful gifts of life. Okay, and it goes on. For it is not the idols that shall be annihilated in his wrath, but those who have raised them, their hearts shall be the prey of everlasting fire, and their less raided bodies shall serve as food for wild beasts. So it's not the idols, it's those who make them, according to this. Okay, he gets uh, a lot of fame from his preachings. And they ask... Is asked by a high priest, Who is this new God of whom you speak of? Do you not know, unhappy man, you are, that Saint Zoroaster is the only just one admitted to the honour of receiving 
communication from the supreme being who has commanded the angels to draw up and write in the words of God laws that were given to Zoroaster and Paros and Esther replied it is not of a new God that I speak but of our heavenly father who existed before the beginning and will still be after the eternal end and so forth yeah so it gets to a point where they get angry at him and throw him out on the road and probably uh, coming up for God has created you in his image innocent pure soul with a heart full of kindness and destined not to the conception of evil projects but to be the sanctuary of love and justice do not therefore sell your hearts I say to you for the eternal being dwells there always etc etc Saint Issa went from place to place strengthening by the word of God the courage of the Israelites who were ready to succumb under the weight of their despair and thousands followed him to hear his preaching but the rulers of the cities feared him and word was sent to the governor etc etc then he was arrested he still continued to preach and he preaches more Eleven. Having heard Isa, the priest and learned men decided among themselves that they would not judge him, for he was doing no one harm. And having presented themselves before Pilate, made governor of Jerusalem by the pagan king of the land of Romulus, they spoke to him thus: We have seen the man whom you accuse of inciting our people to rebellion. We have heard his preaching and know that he is of our people. It's one of these, right? And so forth. And he's preaching. But looks at it again. It's continuing. Must get to the stage where they rid themselves of them. Further on in the book. Okay, yeah, it's, it's got here fourteen. By order of the governor, the soldiers seized upon Issa and the two thieves whom they conducted to the place of torture where they nailed them to the crosses they had erected. All that day the bodies of Issa and of the two thieves remained suspended, etc., etc. At sunset the agony of Issa came to an end. He lost consciousness and the soul of this just man detached himself from body, his body to become part of the divinity. Uh, Thus ended the terrestrial existence of the reflection of the eternal spirit under the form of a man who had saved hardened sinners and endured so much suffering. This is all from these Buddhists, right? Okay, it's not necessarily or not even scriptural. Okay, it doesn't. When you look at it side by side, it's very, very different. Okay, they're basically saying what Islam has been saying. He's a man. That was it. Okay, he's given that spirit or that knowledge of God God used him as a vessel all that sort of stuff he was just a man he was just another prophet he wasn't the son of God etc etc and so The disciples of Saint Issa left the land of Israel and went in all directions among the pagans, telling them that they must abandon the gross errors, think of the salvation of their souls, and of the perfect felicity in store for men in the enlightened and immaterial world, where in repose and in all his purity, his purity dwells the great Creator in perfect majesty. The pagans, their kings and soldiers, listened to these preachers, abandoned their absurd beliefs, deserted their priests and their idols to sing the praises of the all-wise creator of the universe, the King of Kings, whose heart is filled with infinite mercy. And the epitome. And this is uh, by the author, right? In reading the life of Issa, Jesus Christ, we are at first struck by the similarity between some of its principal passages and the biblical narrative. Okay, he's talking about the supposed writings of the Brahmins that the Buddhists had, etc., etc., in reading the life of Issa, or Jesus Christ, we are, at first, we are at first struck by the similarity between some of its principles, passages, principal passages and the biblical narrative, while on the other hand, we also find equally remarkable 
contradictions, as we just pointed out, which constitute the difference between the Buddhist version and that found in the Old and New Testaments. To explain the singularity, we must take into account the periods in which the facts were recorded. In childhood, we were taught to believe that the Pentateuch was written by Moses himself. This is the Jews, right? And maybe some Christians or something like that. But the thing that is, people don't realise that the Jews have admitted, well, well, it's a customary thing, it's our custom to attribute a book or writings, a scroll, whatever, to someone. Okay? So, the name Moses gets attributed to him because it's speaking about Moses and all that stuff, right? You know, stop and think about it. Use common sense, logic, reality. Okay? Did Moses write about himself when he was apparently dead? Okay? How can you write about yourself when you're dead, your body's hidden somewhere by God because the angel and the devil are fighting over it? Yeah, so, that saying that you know somebody wrote it when they were dead is uh, absurd right okay so yeah because it's the custom the custom they have to put a name to the writings they said yeah okay we we admit that he didn't actually write it maybe he didn't write it but we attribute it to him okay because it speaks of Moses etc etc et whatever other reason they have In childhood, we are taught to and believe that the Pentateuch was written by Moses himself, but the careful investigations of contemporary savants have conclusively demonstrated that in the days of Moses, and even long after him, there existed no writings in those countries, bathed by the Mediterranean, save the Egyptian hieroglyphics and the cuneiform inscriptions still found in the ex excavations of Babylon. But we know to the contrary that the alphabet and parchment were known and used in China and India long before Moses. So, yeah, a lot of it was oral. It was verbally told everybody had to memorize it. So that was the oral tradition. But they probably did use some sort of writing like pictographs, you know, write on parchment, all that sort of stuff, or on cave walls, all that sort of stuff prior. Until somebody decided, well, hey, look, animal skin. Hey, look, some ink, or whatever. You could write it down, you know. And then it becomes scrolls. They write it on scrolls. Then later on, compiled which is called Biblos, or a whole collection of books, right? The writings, the texts, whatever, right? All piled into one. These massive scrolls. So when they get invaded, what do the Jews do? The Israelites do to pick up these scrolls, the most precious scrolls, these sacred writings. They pick them up and somebody runs with them, right? Even if there's three or four guys, they've got to lift this huge scroll. They'll run with it to protect it, right? To preserve it. And then they'll hide it, you know? Hide the smaller ones, etc., etc., uh, probably even the old copies garbage copies you know that sort of stuff so a lot of these places where they find these scrolls and it's like oh this looks like a copy of Isaiah but maybe it's just something is corrupted or something or uh, some of these script is something on there wrong you know it's basically a garbage dump for that or they're in a hurry and they hit them they're like in these sealed jars and all that sort of stuff yeah stuff like that But uh, yeah, like the Phoenicians, um, people of the sea, they traded with the Egyptians. You got the Akkadians, who were supposedly the forefathers of the uh, Israelites, the Hebrews, all that sort of stuff. Um, where their language originated from, all this sort of stuff. Yeah, they had their cuneiform tablets, those wedge style writings, you know, the way they wrote on this soft clay and all that sort of stuff uh, they probably were influenced we've got a book here somewhere called the time tables of uh, history where it states in a certain part of the book column that the Egyptians well according to the scriptures they're actually uh, descendants of the one of the sons of Noah uh, Ham okay so they're basically Semitic to start off with they had the Semitic style of writing until at some point they went from right to left, Semitic style to demagogic. Okay, the hieroglyphics basically became uh, demotic. That's the word, demagogic. Demotic, right? A demotic script. So they probably influenced each other, like the Arameans or whoever, 
the Syrians that you know, traded with them, etc. See, well, we want an easier way of writing this cuneiform way. It's too damn hard. You know, it's difficult. Um, it's all right for the elites, the higher ups. You know, they've learnt it. They're educated with it. All that sort of stuff. They know what they're doing. But for us that are learning it, yeah, it's a bit of a task. We want something easier. So someone says, okay, we'll take, we'll borrow from here. We'll borrow your idea. And maybe the Egyptian says, well, we'll borrow your idea. And someone else says, oh, we'll borrow your idea. And then one went away, created this alphabet. Right? In this language. And then the other one said, well, okay, blah, blah, blah. And created these. But originally they were both Semitic. Okay? These Hebrews, these Israelites, these Chaldeans, the Mesopotamia, etc., Aramaeans, they were Semites. And the Egyptians were of the sons of Noah, according to the scriptures. Ham. Okay? They even have the same name as a word uh, in the Egyptian language. Okay? They have Cam, but the K is silent. So they say Ham. And then the Egyptians apparently have Cam, but again, that K is silent. Okay. We're not too sure if it's the same word, but they used it, a lot of them used it today as Chemites, okay. which really should be Hemites or Hamites. Okay. They're really Hamites or Hemites. Okay, to go check out the uh, Genesis genealogy list for that. Okay, uh, so we're going to skip on to the next page. Okay, uh, where's this? Get back here. Okay, in childhood we are taught to believe that the Pentateuch was written by Moses himself, but the careful investigations of contemporary savants have conclusively demonstrated that in the days of Moses and even long after him, there existed no writings in those countries bathed by the Mediterranean, save the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So, and, and the cuneiform inscriptions still found in the excavations of Babylon. So this Moses, being in the court of the Egyptians, and being educated by those Egyptians in the Egyptian religion, customs, traditions, and writing, would have learned that. So that backs up the claim that he knew this other language, this Egyptian language, called Kotav Hotib. Okay, we haven't found it yet. We have seen little hints of it, but nobody up there has actually produced any manuscripts or anything like that of this Tav Hotep, this Egyptian that uh, Moses learnt he spoke, right? Maybe wrote in, until he was like possibly well versed uh, you know, maybe they had a like according to this book Israelites were employed to teach him how to write their way right? You learn their language write like them and all that sort of stuff maybe that's what happened, right? But when he leaves He's ha had to learn their language. Okay, because don't forget, he's in the court of the Egyptians, so he's not learning it. He's not learning their language. But to communicate with them, okay, he finds his relations or whatever, and they're speaking a certain language, so he has to learn that, which is the either the Tav Asherit or the Tav Ivri, the original, ancient, very old Aramaic or the Tav Ivri, the original ancient, very old Hebrew, okay, which is basically, you could say also that perhaps there's this version out there that was Hebrew Aramaic or Aramaic Hebrew. Sometimes you find it in those books that talk about it. Okay, this person spoke, in that time spoke Hebrew Aramaic or Aramaic Hebrew. They're both sister languages, and they're both very different from what people are using today. They're using a modern form. Not that original, ancient, very old form, because it's long dead, no longer written, no longer spoken. Okay, it's gone the way of the dodo or the dinosaur. But these people have a modern form of that. So you have to remember that that form is not the original form. Okay, it's a form of it, but it's not the original form. So these people today are not speaking the original tongues because they're long dead, unless they use a certain system when they come across the original ancient very old manuscripts preserved right 
Okay, they've got to translate this long dead language. How do they do that? Well, they have to use a certain method involving the modern form or the modern vernacular, the modern version to do so because they have similar words, which would have similar meanings. But way, way, way back prior to the scribes and monks copying the Old Testament Tab Asherit by hand in Urhai or Urhai or Urfa in Arabic, Edessa, modern Turkey, 800 BCE. It's a very different language, right? Very, very old. So you would have to use that system to do that. They had the Hebrew Aramaic, or the Hebrew, the Tav Ivri, had uh, the Aramaic had same words, same meanings, because the uh, Tav Asheri or Asherit, Tav Ivri, the ancient, original ancient old Hebrew, had the same words, same meanings. But somewhere along the way, further down the centuries, probably the Masoretes started to add vowels, because originally they didn't have vowels, they had consonants, right? The Aramaic looks like it had a vowel, an A, but that was considered a consonant. Okay. Isn't the word Allaha, etc. Okay, so these Masoretes started to add vowels to make it more, possibly more easier to pronounce people who can't speak the language or something, whatever their reason was, and they started adding, they started adding vowels and they started adding marker points or vowel points in their markers which basically changed the structure of that language. So it created a difference between those words that were once similar, okay? Not only changed the structure, but also changed the meaning of those words. So, for example, you have the word in the Brita, in the ancient Aramaic, right? From the Lishana Tikisapra, sacred scribe language of God, which is Iyuma, which means immeasurable period, unfavorable period, Eon era, age or day with a capital D because it's a different kind of day possibly in relation to God making the two great lights the sun and the moon right and the lunar solar cycle okay then in your modern Hebrew translations you have D day with a little d okay um, Iuma means a miserable unfathomable period age or eon or era or day with capital D because no man was created at that time to get up early in the morning see what God was doing and write it down in his diary right okay and pass it on so with the Hebrew Yom it's very different okay it's suddenly different which means day with a little capital D okay with a little D sorry little capital D a little D okay a different kind of day it's like you, it, it seems to be like in the Jewish Bibles, the translations or whatever, it's got this little d, okay, which is signifying a day of the week. Very, very different from the word iuma, which is uh, a miserable period, unfavorable period, era, age, and so forth. There's a great difference there. And you notice that we use, a lot of times we use the original ancient, very old, Okay, that's because it differentiates the modern dialects of today. Everybody's learning at universities, uh, seminars, whatever. Okay, courses online. That's not the original form. Okay, they're learning a modern version, but they're claiming, "Oh, we 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 are learning the original. We've got the original." Baloney. You can't have the original unless you've got the original manuscripts. Okay, and you translate it from those. That original ancient long dead language. It's a dead language. Norse is dead, uh, Germanic is dead, Old Latin is dead, Old English is dead. So how are you going to restore those? And how can you say that you have this long dead language, uh, that you have this original, you're using this, or translating from this original language, the original mother tongues, etc. like that, when it's a dead language? That's ludicrous, that's absurd, that's insane. Okay? You have to have, as you said, you have to have some sort of manuscript, original manuscript in that language and then use a certain method to be able to translate it. Okay? So probably experts can do that, but a lot of these Americanized modern English Bible versions, 
where they say in the introduction, the preface, or whatever, oh, we um, translate it all from the original Aramaic, original Greek, original Hebrew, original this, that, 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 whatever. It's a load of rubbish. Unless they use that kind of method, or somebody there says, well, we're, we've got an expert scholar that used this method, right? They don't indicate that. Okay? See, people are too busy flicking through the Bible and going, oh, yeah, God said this, Jesus said that, and then... Paul said this and that, 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 and they want to argue about it, right? But they never read the first two pages. Yeah? Introduction, the preface, even the copyright uh, rules there, right? That you, if you're going to use verses out of the Bible, you can use up to 500 words, but then you have to put underneath the source. Oh, from the NKJV or the NIV or uh, Dewey's. Catholic Bible or whatever, right? That's part of their copyright license. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in childhood we were taught to believe that the Pentateuch was written by Moses himself, but the careful investigation of the contemporary, blah, blah, blah. But we know to the contrary that the alphabet and parchment were known and used in China and India long before Moses. Of this we have ample proof. The sacred books of the religion of the wise men teaches us that the alphabet was invented in China 